Over the past 20 years, a rapper by the name of Blue has been building a legacy that few artists in hip hop's history can match. He is one of the West Coast's primary colors, combining the pristine pen of a poet with the experimental artistry of a French New Wave filmmaker. You probably know Blue from his few underground classic records with his closest collaborator Exile, but his discography goes deeper than most people even realize. Over the past 20 years, he's released over 40 albums, mixtapes, and EPs as an MC, and over a dozen beat tapes and other full-length albums as a producer. To say that he has been prolific throughout his career would be an understatement. But today, I'm going to give you all a history lesson on hip-hop's favorite color, blue. When most people think of Blue's career, it starts with his 2007 classic, Below the Heavens. This has grown to become one of the most respected West Coast albums of the 2000s. But let's start back even farther than that. Johnson Barnes was born in April of 1983. He got his start battle rapping as a part of a battle rap club in high school, and was heavily involved in the LA battle rap scene of the early 2000s. If you want to see some early footage of Blue as a battle rapper, he was featured in the 2004 documentary, The Battle for LA. The battle scene helped Blue sharpen his pen, but as one of the most introspective writers of his time, his true skill set would be unlocked once he started recording music himself. One of his classmates at San Pedro High School was a singer by the name of Miguel Jantel. If that name sounds familiar, it's because Miguel went on to become one of the most successful R&B superstars of the past 15 years. Blue and Miguel formed a group in high school called Rhythm and Blue, and they recorded their first demos together. These demos got into the hands of High Tech, who was most known at the time for working with Most Def and Talib Kweli. High Tech flew Miguel out to record some music, and he wanted to officially produce the Rhythm and Blue demos. The only problem was he wanted to have Miguel be the singer, but he was going to replace Blue with Most Def. While he was disappointed with this at first, Blue took it as motivation to prove to High Tech that he could live up to the iconic artistry that Most was known for at the time. In 2021, Most Def gave an interview, and when asked who his favorite artists were at the time, Blue was one of the first artists that he named. Are you listening to any other musicians today? Are there any rappers catching your ear? You have a very distinguished ear. You don't listen to everything. Oh, I mean, I mean, I, you know, I just, man, there's so many people. I mean, Earl Sweatshirt, always uh, Blue, my kind. Yeah, I got a, it's a... So Blue ended up getting the last laugh of the situation. Rhythm and Blue record was never released, but Blue and Miguel went on to collaborate over a dozen times over the years, and every single time it was so special. The two have such great chemistry, and they always bring out the best in each other on each track. Over the next couple years, Blue would have his own brushes with success, having meetings with Grammy award-winning producer Megahertz, and even almost signing with the legendary Death Row Records in 2003. After many meetings and pitches, Blue ultimately decided to release his first album independently. Many people think of Below the Heavens as Blue's debut, but he actually won't get to that for a few years. His real first album was called California Soul, and it was released in 2003. A small number of physical copies were pressed up at the time, and up until recently there was no sign of this album anywhere on the internet. To start off 2024, Blue released 12 albums in 7 days to fill out the missing pieces of his discography. I'll be sure to cover each of these albums later in the video, but us finally getting California Soul was amazing. The album was produced by Els and Bombay, and has features from many early Blue collaborators such as Miguel, Donnell Smokes, and Cassius King. On the album you can hear the youth in Blue's voice and delivery, but it has all the soul that he's become known for on his later projects. Blue released another project in 2003 that acts as a great companion piece to California Soul. He teamed up with his frequent collaborator Donnell Smokes, who at the time was going under the name Black Spade, and together they formed the Bruise Brothers. As one of the least known Blue albums that we have, this is such an underrated gem within his discography. Blue credits Donnell Smokes with essentially teaching Blue how to master rapping when they were younger. Around 2005, Blue met the producer Exile, who had made a name for himself working with Aloe Black as the group Eminon. Blue and Exile immediately hit it off, and the duo would go on to form the most important partnership in either of their careers. In 2006, Blue released Lifted, the core mixtape, and that's the first real taste that people got of Blue as the artist that he would become most known as. Most of the production was handled by Exile, and his light and soulful production style is the perfect backdrop for Blue's bar-heavy lyrical approach. This tape even features KRS-One and has a song produced by Jay Dilla, so Blue was already getting cosigns from hip-hop legends, and his career was only just beginning. Below the Heavens was officially released in the summer of 2007, and is probably the most essential Blue project to date. If you only listen to one Blue album, then this would be it. 
He rips off some of the most thoughtful and introspective lyricism that has ever been laid to wax. His words on this project are so powerful, while being relatable to everyone. The lyrical precision from Blue is phenomenal. It really feels like he was waiting his whole entire life to make this record, and he put all 25 years of his life into every word. The full title to the album is Below the Heavens, In Hell, Happy with Your New Imaginary Friend, and that perfectly exemplifies what this album feels like. Exile crafts a soundscape that feels both heavenly and like an imaginary dreamscape. From the moment you first listen to the record, you feel like you've been friends with Blue for years, because he bears so much of his heart and soul on this album. The album had a limited release at the time, but over the years, it has grown to become one of the most respected albums in underground hip-hop history. If Blue had his way, Below the Heavens would not have been his only album that came out in 2007. DMX was one of his favorite MCs, and he famously came out with two incredible albums in his first year on the scene. Blue was going to top this by releasing three albums in 2007. Unfortunately, the label that he released Below the Heavens on had a rule that he couldn't release any other projects within a certain time frame of its release, so he had to postpone those other two. All three of the albums had actually leaked online in 2006, so he already had some buzz in the underground by the time they each came out. His second and third albums show off just how versatile Blue is. He teamed up with Detroit rapper and producer Chirac to release the album The Peace Talks in April of 2008. The duo formed the group Crack, C-R-A-C, which stood for Collect Respect and A Check. This is such an experimental album, not being exclusively a rap album. It has some singing, and even some almost comedic talking skits in it. It's a very playful album, and overall a fun time. Over the years, this has gotten a little lost in the shuffle of Blue's career, but it's very unique and a cool album that I definitely recommend. Later that year, Blue teamed up with the producer Mainframe to release the album Johnson & Johnson. This is one of the best collections of beats and rhymes in his career. He may not be as introspective as On Below the Heavens, or as forward thinking as he is on the Peace Talks, but this is one of the best examples there is for Blue straight up being one of the best rappers alive. Mainframe's beats are simple, but so damn catchy, and Blue just bars out on the whole thing. There's been rumors of Blue and Mainframe coming out with the second Johnson & Johnson record for years now. I was lucky enough to interview Blue for the third issue of Def Magazine a few months back. In the interview he gave a bunch of dope information about some of the albums that we've been waiting for for years. And he gave me a lot of background information about what this second J&J &J album would sound like and when we may be able to expect it. If you're interested in checking out the interview, physical and digital copies are available now at staydef.com. Around this time to rock and mainframe helped teach Blue how to produce as well. In 2010, Blue and Mainframe teamed up with Danny Brown to form the group Danny Johnson. Blue and Mainframe produced the mixtape It's a Art for Danny in 2010. This is a great project, and just the fact that a Blue and Danny Brown project exists at all is just a little bit of hip hop magic. Now that Blue had producing in his repertoire, he would release beat tapes, most notably No Sleep for a Day and Paris Art Nami, which were both released in 2009. He also fully produced the album A Day Late and A Dollar Short for the rapper scene that same year. Blue's production is unmistakably his. Every beat he's made has this dusty quirk to its sound, and I've only really ever heard that style from him. Blue was featured on the cover of XXL as a part of the 2009 XXL freshman class, along with the likes of Kid Cudi, Wale, and Currency. At this point, Blue was handpicked as one of the brightest young stars in hip-hop, and he was only just entering the most artistically fruitful era of his career. In 2009, Blue was in the process of making his solo follow-up to Below the Heavens, but this time he was to produce the entire thing himself. His production alias at the time was Godly Barnes, so naturally, this album was to be called the Godly Barnes LP. Unfortunately, his hard drive crashed, and the master files for this album were lost forever. Blue was able to release the album unmixed and unmastered on the first day of 2010. He released it on Twitter as one continuous mp3 file. Even with the low sound quality, this may just be the most beautiful album in his catalog. The production is straight up godly, and his beats expand on the sonic vocabulary that Exile gave him on their debut, but it has that extra blue style to it. This album is unapologetically blue in every way, and Blue's biggest fans always hold this record right up there with Below the Heavens. The songs Till We Die and My Boy Blue are two of my favorite songs ever made. I made a full video on this album a while back, so check that out if you want to hear more of my thoughts on it. This 2009 to 2012 era is probably my favorite era for Blue. He released so many phenomenal projects in this time, and they all have such different sounds to them. 
The next record that he released was self-produced as well. Her favorite color was recorded and released while Blue was in the midst of a breakup. There's a few hip-hop albums that deal exclusively with love and heartbreak, but this album really pulls it off. Blue weaves in samples from a variety of movies that personify the feelings that he was going through at the moment. His production on this record is so calm and takes its time laying the beautiful yet somber foundation for Blue to open his heart on. This album is some of the best rapping of Blue's career, specifically on the song Amnesia, which I feel is one of the most poetically vivid hip-hop songs ever written. Rapping is an art form built off the introspection of its greatest wordsmiths. When a rapper is able to truly relay who they are with words, it's one of the most amazing things to witness. And at this time, perhaps no one was as great at this as Blue. From the very first song on Below the Heavens, Blue explained what his world is, and every song after that paints a picture of his blue world for the listener. Each album that he releases is a different shade of blue, and with each shade we get, we are able to see a different shade of Johnson Barnes himself. His versatility was on full display in 2011, also releasing the Jesus LP, under the name B. This is the only album ever to be released with production from Mad Lib, The Alchemist, and Knowledge. It showcases a completely different side to Blue, one that's more raw, it ditches the jazzier sound of his first few records for a down and dirty piece of lo-fi excellence. His lyricism, while still impressive, takes a backseat to Blue exploring his sonic range with rhythm and melody. This album is so ahead of its time, paving the way for the lo-fi underground renaissance with artists like Earl Sweatshirt, Makami, and Mike, to embrace the fuzzier, dusty sound that they are drawn to. Blue even sings on some of these tracks, and layers his vocals in a way that feels like a symphony of passed around mixtape sound waves. Blue is a huge fan of cinema. His favorite filmmaker is the French New Wave legend Jean-Luc Godard. Godard was known for breaking down the art form of film, and experimenting with the craft. His best work feels like watching a poem come to life, and Blue has based a lot of his career around the work of Godard. You can especially hear it during this era of Blue. Each of his albums at this time was a pure expression of his artistry, poetry in motion. Blue was unbound by the expectations of modern rap of the time, and he was just on a mission to create, like a new wave director would. Around this time, Blue signed a deal with Warner Records. The executives that hired him had a tremendous amount of faith in his artistic potential, not only signing him to a three-album deal, but the deal also included three feature-length films that Blue was set to write, and the deal also included a sub-label that Blue would run under the Warner umbrella. The first major project that Blue was working on with Warner was No York. This was set to be an album, as well as a feature-length film to go along with it. The film was set to be directed by Khalil Joseph, who went on to direct Kendrick's Good Kid Mad City short film and Beyonce's Lemonade just a few years later. Obviously, the film never came to fruition because of some label politics, but I'll get to that in a minute. First, I want to discuss the album portion of the New York experience. The concept of New York came from the fact that when Blue first came out, everybody heard his style and assumed that he was from New York. So this album, New York, would be him reclaiming his West Coast identity. Blue tapped into the burgeoning West Coast underground scene for the production on this album. This project has production from Flying Lotus, Sam I Am, DiBiase, Exile, and Knowledge. The Warner execs weren't very keen on this idea, and were trying to have Blue get some big names on the production like Pharrell, but Blue was determined to stick to his original concept. Eventually, new higher-ups were brought into Warner, who weren't as on board with the future of Blue as an artist, so he and the label parted ways. The album was leaked in 2011, and then officially released in 2013 under the name York. This may just be Blue's most abrasive and forward-thinking record to date. It sounds nothing like anything that he has put out before or since. The record feels like you are witnessing a futuristic LA invasion, and the surging production combined with Blue's rapping performance makes for an album that is still ahead of its time over a decade later. During the making of this album, Exile sent Blue a bunch of beats for York. At the time, Exile was very into Brazilian music, and sent over a bunch of beats that were more akin to light Brazilian jazz. This was not the vibe that Blue was going for with York, so he pivoted and put those beats towards the second Blue in Exile project. Give Me My Flowers While I Can Still Smell Them is a worthy follow-up to Below the Heavens. The beats are beautiful, and Blue is in his pocket of thoughtful yet playful lyricism that makes for a perfect collaboration between the two. This was the first Blue album that I ever heard, so many of these songs hold a special place in my heart. It may not be quite as ambitious as the rest of his projects at this time, but every time Blue and X link up, it's guaranteed to reach the highest bar of quality. Blue was still very active as a producer into the 2010s, releasing a few beat tapes, including my favorite of his, the Norman Rockwell beat tape, 
and also the LP called Open, which featured a bunch of different rappers rocking over Blue Production. He even produced full projects from a number of MCs as well, working with Rail J. Wallace, Anthem, Cookbook, and Homeboy Sandman, all before the decade was half over. There's also a 100 track beat tape from 2014 called Her Favorite Shit, The Mini Lo-Fi Adventures of Your Imaginary Friend, just proving that nobody was working as hard as Blue at the time. Blue made his return to the West Coast sound with his album Good To Be Home, which was produced by Bombay. If you remember from the beginning of this video, Bombay helped produce Blue's first ever album California Soul, so this album was a return to Blue's roots. The album embodies the feeling of driving around Cali on a hot summer day, tuned to a local radio station that's playing underground gems off of some fuzzy tape decks. Blue never produces another project for himself again, and he instead shifts his focus to working with a different producer on each of his projects. This approach helped Blue showcase the already broad versatility of his style, and also had him working with some of the most talented producers of all time. Blue teamed up with fellow California MC M.E.D. and legendary producer Mad Lib for the 2015 album Bad Neighbor. This album has some of the most popular and head-knocking music of Blue's career, with features from MF Doom, Anderson Pac, and Dame Funk. Most people think that Bad Neighbor was the first project that Blue had released with Mad Lib, but that's not entirely true. Blue had been sitting on a mountain of Mad Lib beats since the late 2000s. He and M.E.D. were originally approached by Mad Lib to make an album together in 2009 as a part of his Medicine Show series. When that offer didn't pan out, Blue took it upon himself to release a mixtape over all Mad Lib beats in 2012. UCLA is yet another ode to LA life from Blue. The project has been largely forgotten over the years because Mad Lib and his team asked Blue to take it down since it wasn't an official Mad Lib release. But even with the low quality mixing and the thrown together nature of the tape, hearing Prime Blue rock these funky classic Mad Lib beats is a treat to the ears. Before I move on to the next era of Blue's career, I want to take a minute to appreciate what he's done as a feature artist over the years. Blue is so talented at crafting album experiences for his fans. He is one of the most talented writers in rap history. He has been tapped to do hundreds of features over the course of his career, and he never disappoints. When people talk about the legendary feature runs of artists like J. Cole, Andre 3000, and Lil Wayne, Blue belongs in that list. Every year he gathers up the best features from his past 12 months and has a DJ make them into a dope mixtape for his fans. There's been 12 entries to his Soul Amazing mixtape series, and he's showing no signs of stopping anytime soon. A different DJ mixes each entry, and if I had to recommend just one, then it would have to be Volume 5, which compiles every single collaboration between Blue and The Alchemist and it's a pretty amazing group of songs. I consider 2016 to be the official start of the third period of Blue's career. He's already well established within the underground and past his era of heavy experimentation, but now with his sound perfected, he is more consistent than ever. He released three projects in 2016, each with a different producer. His first release of the year was the EP Crenshaw Jezebel, with production from Ray West and features from AG and Dave Dar. This project often gets overlooked within Blue's deep discography, but the quality is there. This album is a showcase in quiet nostalgia. Everything about the project feels like listening to a distant memory. For his second EP of that year, he and producer Fate teamed up for Open Your Optics to Optimism. The production on this project was very airy and ethereal, and Blue pushed the boundaries of his lyricism, dropping his down-to-earth relatability for a more conceptual and philosophical approach and he ended off that year teaming up with the French production duo Union Analogtronics for the album Cheetah in the City. This is one of the most ambitious projects of his career, taking this electronic and bombastic production and lacing some of the more abstract and pointed lyricism in his catalog. Blue has had many conceptual albums over the years, but this is the first time that his lyrics tell a story throughout an album's runtime. The story of the album falls a young man raised amongst drug dealers and murderers, but he slowly starts morphing into a cheetah, becoming a money-hungry predator, and literally becoming the king of the city. It really is a one-of-a-kind piece of work. Blue made two EPs with Virginia legend Knots, 2013's Gods in the Spirit, and 2015's Titans in the Flesh. The duo ended up combining these projects to form the remastered Gods in the Spirit, Titans in the Flesh. Blue and Knots are such a dynamic duo. Knotts' production is always knocking, and big enough for Blue to wax poetic heaters, epic enough to walk amongst the gods and titans. He is so locked in lyrically on these projects. He's able to mix concepts that are so far out of this world, while always bringing it down to reality and giving each song a personal touch. On the track End of the World, 
Blue takes us on a journey to the infinite reaches of the universe, starting off his second verse rapping about pulling heaven out of a star, and ending it tackling the harsh realities of police brutality. In 2018, Blue gave us yet another ode to LA life, this time channeling the gangbanging culture that he has been circling for years. The Blueprint is one of the most misunderstood projects of Blue's career. This is one of the fuzziest sounding projects with the unmixed and unmastered sound returning. But the Shafiq Hussein beats on this album range from beautiful to hard hitting, and Blue feels like he's at his most comfortable on this record. This project is the blueprint for everything that Blue represents. According to Blue, his birth father was a G on the streets, and his stepfather was a reverend. It's the dichotomy between these two figures in his life that inform his entire artistic persona. For every introspective album reaching for a higher power like Below the Heavens, Jesus, or God is Good, he has an equally blue street album like Good To Be Home or The Blueprint. A lot of people are turned off with the low sound quality of this record, but they're missing the point. This album and the other unmixed blue records are channeling the sound of his youth. Passing around cassette tapes with underground heat on them, Blue was able to manufacture and master the sound of this history. Blue stopped producing sometime in the mid-2010s, after his studio was robbed, but he had enough beats left over to lay the production on a few more MC's albums. He produced On and Off Top for Chris Clark, King JR for John Robinson, and I for Jabby. In 2018, he produced the DS Dumbstyle mixtape. Dumbstyle stood for Dope Underground Mixtape Beats, sent to young lyrical MCs, and it's a bombardment of beats, bars, and beautiful music. The robbery of his studio really set Blue back. It was demoralizing for him, losing all of his equipment and some of the master files to his songs. He was able to channel some of the negative energy of this situation into his art though. In 2019, he made the album A Long Red Hot Los Angeles Summer Night, and the album is a story record, essentially telling the story of that robbery, but from the perspective of the robbers. The album was produced by Mad Lib's brother, Oh No, and it literally feels like listening to a movie on wax, and it is without a doubt one of the best storytelling records in the modern era of hip-hop. He also released two EPs that same year. First there was Ground and Water with Damu the Fudge Monk. This tape has such a dope sound to it, and has Blue channeling the earth itself and all of its pieces for the record. And then he released Underground Makes the World Go Round with Fat Jack, paying homage to the west coast pioneers of the underground that paved the way for Blue and his contemporaries. For the 10th anniversary of Below the Heavens, Blue and Exile released a compilation tape called In the Beginning, which had all the throwbacks of their work before their first record. To many fans of the duo, it felt like we may never get a new album of new material from them again. Luckily, those worries were put to rest in 2020, when Blue and Exile linked back up to release Miles. The full name of this album is Miles, from an interlude called Life, and it is the crowning achievement in both of Blue and Exile's careers. Blue digs back into his roots, as a man and as an artist, to explore the origins of everything that makes him Blue. This album is almost an hour and a half long, and no second of sound is wasted. Blue's lyricism is at its most intricate and introspective here, and Exile gives him one of the best produced albums of the decade to work over. When they first started working on this album, it was a trap record which I am so fascinated by. The duo wanted to be looking forward, but there was still so much in the past that they needed to explore, and it ended up giving us what in my opinion is a masterpiece. Blue is teased a few times that the trap record may be coming out someday, so we'll have to be on the lookout for that. I made a full video on Miles a couple years back and I'm super proud of that one, so feel free to check that out if you want to hear more of my thoughts on it. Most artists who come out the gate with a classic debut record are usually not able to live up to that hype, let alone top it. But Blue and Exile did just that, and Blue wasn't even close to being done. In 2021, he released a couple of EPs, For Sale with Surplus, and The Narrative with Mickey Fax and Knots. But he closed out that year with an album that could almost go toe to toe with Miles. Blue released The Color Blue in September of 2021, and it's the purest form of Blue that we have ever gotten. The album is an ode to everything that makes Blue, Blue. And with it being his first album since York that has beats from multiple producers, it really has a unique feel to it, channeling multiple sides of his sound. Recently Blue released two other versions of this album, Other Shades of Blue, which has 10 bonus songs, and the original Color Blue demos, which is the original version of the album with all beats produced by Blue himself. After 20 years in the game, Blue is not slowed down in the slightest, and his catalog of underrated gems keeps getting deeper. Last year he teamed up with his fellow West Coast legend, Fat Lip, from the far side, and together they released Live from the End of the World, and this year his reign continued, 
releasing the blue tape with his frequent collaborator Cassius King, bad news with rising producer Real Bad Man, and just a month ago he reunited with Knotts for the album Africa, an album that continues the Afrocentric tradition of hip-hop's roots while pushing their sound into new realms not reached on their previous collaborations. Blue has dubbed 2024 as the Year of Indigo, releasing a tidal wave of new shades of himself for his fans. He started off the year by releasing 12 old projects onto streaming services. They consisted of some instrumental projects, some lost albums that many fans hadn't heard, some remixed versions of his classic records, and some collections of bonus songs from the sessions of his most beloved eras. As someone who has dedicated my life to being one of the biggest Blue fans in the world, hearing so much music that I hadn't heard before was incredible, and he closed it all out by releasing a greatest hits album called Best Lyricist Underground. Over the past two decades, Blue has built one of the best careers that an underground artist could ask for. He's gotten acclaim from critics and fans around the world, and has been able to do it all on his own terms, able to explore every avenue of his creativity. Blue has been able to paint the world his favorite color, undoubtedly making his impact on hip-hop and on the lives of so many fans from across the world. In recounting his career, it's so impressive how much he's been able to accomplish, but also it's crazy to hear everything that almost happened to him, or that he just missed out on. What if High Tech produced that original album for him and Miguel? What if he never lost the original files of God is Good? And what if he was able to fulfill his three album and three film deal with Warner? Blue still has so much of himself to give to the world, and I hope that in another 20 years, we'll have so many more shades of blue to appreciate. Personally, Blue's music has changed my life in so many ways. It's been the soundtrack to so many of the most important moments of my life. And for that reason, Blue will always be my favorite color. Thank you so much for watching everybody. Blue is my favorite artist of all time, so I've been waiting to make this video for literally years. I know this was a long one, so if you made it this far, thank you so much. Drop your favorite Blue album down in the comments. I hope that even if you're the biggest Blue fan ever, you are still able to learn a little something from this video. I take a lot of pride in being able to put people on to some music that they may not have known before, and I hope I was able to do that for you today. As I've been mentioning for this whole video, I recently interviewed Blue for our third issue of Deaf Magazine, so if you want to check that out, you can head over to staydeaf.com. I am so proud of how that interview and the entire issue came out, so make sure you guys go check that out. I want to give a super special shout out to my patrons. We're coming to the end of 2023, so it's officially been a full year of my Patreon. So if you join now, you get a whole back catalog of playlists and exclusives. I also recently started doing a monthly podcast for my patrons, where I talk about my thoughts on all the music I've been listening to each and every month. This upcoming podcast is going to have my top 25 favorite albums of the year, so if you want to hear that, make sure to check out patreon.com slash defgoldbloom. I have so many amazing things planned for you guys for 2024, so stay tuned, stay safe, and stay deaf. Thanks for watching.